Although well-intentioned, CRT's original goal to examine the law that affects race has morphed into notions by some adherents that even the American flag is a symbol of hatred and bigotry and that white people are oppressors. Some proponents of CRT suggest we should see everything through the lens of racism, and that appears to have led to teaching of slavery and other discrimination with so much emphasis that positive American history is excluded. So is CRT or its undercurrent in our public schools? I discovered in one Idaho Falls school, fifth graders read Chains, a book about slavery during the American Revolutionary War, not the Civil War. In a school in Coeur d'Alene, seventh graders read Freedom Walkers, a book about civil rights and protests. In both instances, books on the American framers and founding principles appear to be omitted. According to current Idaho Common Core standards, American history is not taught until fifth grade. While other history and social studies are taught through the English language curriculum to second and to fourth graders. This curriculum includes stories about slaves, civil rights, women's rights, but leaves out information on our country's founding. We should teach about slavery and civil rights, but not at the expense of other positive events in US history. In an ongoing survey conducted by the Idaho chapter of the National Education Guardians, which presently includes a sampling of approximately 60 students in second through eighth grade in about 20 counties in Idaho, the results show 54% of second and third graders learned about Rosa Parks. They said she stood for fairness. She peacefully protested bus seating rules. 82% said they learned about George Washington, but their answers were less articulate and included first president, bad teeth, nasty teeth, wooden teeth. 60% of the second and third graders said they learned about slavery. One student wrote, slavery was and is not good. People deserve better. Those who still hurt should be hurt. 76% fourth through eighth graders said they learned about Rosa Parks. Here are two examples of several well-stated answers. She refused to move to the back of the bus and was arrested. That's one of the reasons the civil rights movement started and Martin Luther King led us. Rosa Parks lived in segregation and went to jail for not giving up her seat. She worked with Martin Luther King for the rights of colored people. However, only 40% responded that they learned anything about James Madison and mainly listed that he was a U.S. president. There was no mention of his work on the Constitution. 56% said they learned about the Founding Fathers. Here are two responses. They were all old white men. The other response, they're white. They had all the power. They made the laws. They favored white people with the laws. They don't fairly represent people of color. 85% said they learned about slavery. Here are their responses. White people are bad. People today are still affected by slavery. We owe them. 65% of fourth and eighth graders said they learned something about the Bill of Rights. It's outdated. It needs to be updated. It doesn't represent all the people in the nation. They need change, my teacher said. To the question, what do you believe makes America the greatest country on earth? Answers included, it isn't, nothing. Teacher said it's not. I don't believe America is the greatest, it has too many flaws. I don't know that America is the greatest country, what is so bad about other countries? Finally, to the question, what is the most important thing you have learned about America, came these answers. We are a country of misplaced people. We are not nice. Nothing. They don't talk about America. Most of America is uneducated and we are more concerned about the rich than the regular people. Slavery probably gets important to know the bad things the country's done. We learned a lot about history and civil rights movements from reading stories in our English classes. These results suggest to me that CRT and its undertones are firmly in place in some of our Idaho public schools. CRT doctrine applies, appears to enter through the underlying Common Core approved curriculum with its requirement of 50% instructional reading texts 
which is to include recommended books and stories about history and social studies in the early grades. Much of this early curriculum imparts a distorted picture of our history. I recommend that the Idaho State Department of Education drop this 50% mandated requirement. Balanced exposure to American history should be required in the reading curriculum before fifth grade. I also recommend that young children be taught the founding principles of our nation before being taught about slavery and civil rights. In addition, I propose that students be taught that America was the first nation in the world to ban importation of slaves and that it fought a bloody civil war to bring about emancipation. Let me be clear, educators should teach the evils of slavery and discrimination, but in proper balance with the rest of US history. Finally, given that the current Idaho teacher certification standards require student teacher candidates to quote, recognize the potential of bias in his or her representation of the discipline and seek to appropriately address problems of bias, unquote, and given that interviewers of student teacher candidates are to engage in conversations with them to identify the candidate's own bias, and given that education standards are in place for them to do the same with their students. I recommend that these teacher certification and education standards and practices concerning bias be revised in keeping with the new Idaho Code 33-138. I'd like to close with this personal short story. My father's family came to San Francisco from Greece in the early 1900s when the city was consisted of Greek town, Italian town, Russian town, Chinatown, Spanish town, etc. And like most other immigrants, he didn't speak a word of English. But he went to school, he listened to the teachers and administrators teach and talk in English. He and other students then worked together to learn the new language. When these students went home, they practiced their own cultures, the language, the food, the music, the dancing, the celebrations. But my dad said, quote, when we went to school, we went as Americans. The land of the free was a new hope, an opportunity for more education, work, and achievement. Life in that melting pot had its challenges to be sure. But from cl his classmates came doctors, lawyers, teachers, administrators, athletes, and a mayor of San Francisco. These students didn't call attention, or these schools didn't call attention to skin color or other differences. They simply taught reading, writing, arithmetic, science, under the idea that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. America remains a place of ideals and dreams. Recognizing its accomplishments, as well as its mistakes, is central to a sound understanding of its true and important history. Viewing everything through the lens of racism creates division where there was a division, and demonstrates that a professed improvement measure, especially when taken too far, can do more harm than good. Thank you. And for the record, I'm going to submit my written remarks and the accompanying references. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. And would you be willing to take any questions from the committee? Um, sure. Yeah. Are there any questions from the committee for for Reverend Wilson? Hey, first of all, thank you very, very much. And I, I had the privilege of reading what you said before, and I like it better and I love it now. Thank you. Um, question, and I, this is going to sound more like a comment in some ways it is, but you mentioned you mentioned James Madison and the, the, uh, the kids went, all they knew was that he was a president. Apparently they did not know, and I'm asking you to verify this, apparently they did not know of his incredibly old condemnation of slavery, or Ben Franklin's, or Thomas Jefferson's, or George Washington. And I'm betting, I'm betting nobody wrote about the Northwest Ordinance that forbade slavery in the territories in any states that would be created out of it, the Northwest Territory. And that counts for that between that and the six states that outlawed slavery during the Revolution. That's at least 11 states right there before the end of the Revolution. Well, and I bet they didn't, didn't hear about that either. Committee member, I just want to remind you to speak through the chair. Oh, That's I apologize. Okay. That's how we know we're teaching them up like that. I'm sorry, my 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 piece was going. Okay. Elaine, okay. uh, oh, yes. there were no responses like that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Any other questions from the committees? Well, thank you for your presentation, your homework, and we look forward to receiving your recommendations, Elaine.
Next on our agenda is a presentation from Professor Nafis Alam. He is here in the room, and he is here to give us a, a presentation regarding point counterpoint teaching philosophy. So I'd like to welcome Mr. Alam to the committee. Welcome, if you would please, again, just state your name and who you represent to the committee today. And welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Absolutely, yeah. So my name is Professor Nafis Alam, and I represent myself. And I just want to make it clear that even though I am a professor at Boise State University, what my opinions are here expressed don't reflect the opinions of Boise State University, nor do they reflect the opinions of any other faculty member on uh, in, within Boise State University. I just want to make that clear. I do thank you all for having me and inviting me to speak here today. I will start my presentation by saying that this will likely be somewhat of a dissenting opinion uh, compared to a relative to past task force meetings. Um, and with that, I'll get started with uh, the point counterpoint teaching philosophy. The problem um, that I wanted to sort of try and address here is confirmation bias. If we could go to the next slide as well, please. So here we have defined confirmation bias. Um, so we have uh, uh, not seeking out objective facts, interpreting information to support your existing beliefs, uh, our ex existing beliefs, only recommending um, uh, things that, sorry, I can't see, only remembering details that upheld, uh, opposed your beliefs, and ignoring information uh, that challenges uh, your beliefs. So this would be, um, you know, just a synopsis of confirmation bias. Professors are human, as we know. Um, and humans have opinions, and humans are predisposed to confirmation bias to validate their opinions. Uh, some professors may unintentionally express their opinions as facts. Some might, uh, by exclusively using sources that confirm their biases. Again, this is not an opinion that it represents Boise State University. I'll probably keep saying that several times over, just so it's clear. This is my teaching philosophy. It's not uh, shared by anybody else that I know of. Uh, I want to share one of my uh, biases here. Um, I am a first-generation immigrant. I was born in Libya. Uh, my family and ancestry is Bangladesh. We came to the United States when I was seven years old. Uh, relative to what I've experienced in Libya, which I was probably too young to remember all that, but relative to what I experienced in Bangladesh, um, and all the opportunities that my family and I have had here in the United States. I have my doctorate degree, my dad has his doctorate degree, my mom has her master's degree, my brother is working with American Express at a pretty high level. So you could say that uh, we've been very fortunate and had a lot of opportunities coming into the United States. As a result, when I speak about uh, America, I tend often to uh, approach it as though we are, we may be doing things better than we might actually be doing. So there's my confirmation right there, confirmation bias right there. When I'm thinking, when I'm talking about the United States of America, I hold uh, our country in a, maybe in a higher regard than I should if I'm taking a critical approach to conversations that is. So just wanted to share one of my uh, biases with you uh, to begin with. Um, can we go to the next slide? Uh, the null solution, uh, in my opinion, is censorship. Uh, I, I've, been all, I've always been against censorship and banning uh, any ideas and any concepts. Um, if we go on to the next slide really quickly, I'm not going to spend too much time uh, on differential equations unless anyone's an expert on that. We can get into that if you'd like. But essentially, the null solution of the particular solution differentiates the two, and that the null solution assumes a homogeneous equation. And a particular solution assumes a non-homogeneous equation, if we were to go on to the next slide, and replace the word equation with population, uh, and then we go on to the next slide as well. Uh, what we'd see is that uh, the reason why censorship, in my opinion, in my opinion alone, is the null solution is because it assumes a homogeneous uh, population, um, otherwise I would sort of consider it to be intellectual uniformity, assumes that members of a population agree with one another, it assumes that students at a university agree with one another. It assumes that faculty at a university agree with one another. And I can tell you that based on my experience uh, at Boise State and at universities prior to that, um, there is a great deal of conversation. We, we're never in a room where everyone just agrees with one another. We're having conversations uh, 
disagreeing with one another, trying to uh, you know, think about the diversity of thoughts. Uh, in this case, it, uh, this particular solution would not account for diversity of thoughts and values. And this particular solution, in my opinion, is designed to be more rigid. Can you the next slide? Uh, my proposal is a particular solution, which is the count, uh, point counterpoint teaching philosophy. If you can go on to the next slide. Um, here, uh, the point counterpoint teaching philosophy assumes a non homogeneous population, otherwise uh, known as intellectual diversity. It assumes that members of a population disagree with one, with one another, assumes that students in a university disagree with one another, uh, assumes that faculty in a university disagree with one another, and, and I believe it accounts for a diversity of thoughts and values, and I believe that this solution tends on to be more flexible and less rigid. If you can move on to the next slide as well. Uh, my recommendations, and again, no one has to take it, I am just uh, but a faculty member. When we're talking about agreement versus understanding, uh, if the goal here, the aim here, is to reach agreement uh, during any sort of course or any session, then what you might do is avoid the controversial parts of controversial topics like critical race theory. You would increase the status quo, you would stigmatize disagreement, uh, you could potentially decrease intellectual diversity, although it depends on the classroom. Uh, you could also potentially divide students who disagree with the, uh, the pre-existing agreement that you're trying to push, potentially push, I should say. But if your aim is to teach understanding, you would then embrace the controversial parts, uh, you'd uh, inevitably decrease the status quo, uh, you'd destigmatize disagreement, increase intellectual diversity, and potentially, well, I should say, potentially increase intellectual diversity and potentially unite students by agreeing to disagree. This is, uh, you know, uh, obviously it's not a surprise. This is the manner in which I teach. This is my personal teaching philosophy. So in any classroom uh, that I'm in, I foster, try to foster an environment, a safe environment, uh, a safe space for, for differing ideas and different thoughts. We get right into it week one, week two, talk about abortion and uh, 2A and things like that. So I mean, we approach these topics in such a way that I'm not trying to push my values on anybody else. That's not my job as an educator. Uh, my job is to, you know, uh, the question that I ask here is, uh, am I here for my students or are my students here for me? Can you go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> so some of the philosophical pillar pillars of my uh, teaching philosophy for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So uh, the assumption would be that for every point, there must be an equal and opposite, opposite counterpoint. Now, that's not always true. And I'll show uh, some examples of that. I should also mention that if we're going to have points and counterpoints, I have to admit that this presentation by itself must inevitably be flawed if this presentation is the point, that there must be a counterpoint to, uh, to the value of this presentation. So my opinion would be that those who believe that there is no counterpoint and no counterargument to their positions and to their points and, and to their uh, arguments might not understand uh, where they're coming from, might not understand their original point and argument. A few quotes here, uh, John F. Kennedy, uh, too often we enjoy the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. Uh, how often are our opinions formed without much thought would be a question, sort of a, a rhetorical, obviously it's not a discussion style here. Can we move on to the next slide? Benjamin Franklin, um, if everyone is thinking alike, then no one is thinking. And here I have a couple of examples. Um, this is one example of how there sometimes is not a counterpoint to the point. So if I were to say something like, food is important, I don't think anyone would say, yeah, no, in peace, you're wrong. But if I were to say breakfast is important, now we're actually thinking, right? We might say, well, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Someone else, like myself, would say breakfast is the least important meal of the day, right? So now we're, we're actually thinking. But if we're only confined to saying things that we all agree upon, then are we really thinking, or are we just regurgitating whatever it is that's being, uh, that, that we're being asked to, uh, to speak on? Next slide, please. And finally, there is no conversation more boring than the one everybody, than the one where everybody agrees, Michel de Montagne. Education is supposed to be fun. It has always been fun. We've been learning our entire lives, ever since childhood. Uh, when did it become boring? Also a rhetorical question. And now, uh, I personally don't find education to be boring, otherwise I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. Um, but I think, you know, just uh, uh, creating an environment where it is a safe space to have discussions and disagreements, 
I think it actually makes for a more fun environment. Um, so I, you know, in that sense, I do think that uh, topics, controversial topics like critical race theory, as long as they're taught in, in conjunction with other theories that may be conflicting with that particular theory, I don't see anything wrong with that. Can you go on to the next slide, please? Higher education, perception versus reality. Again, this is my perception, um, uh, rather, not, this is my understanding of how things are being seen. Uh, so you know, from a perception standpoint, uh, there's intergraph of uh, education equals agreement, and uh, the perception uh, generally in society tends to often be that professors teach students what to think. Um, but in reality, my experience has been, again, I have my doctorate degree, three decades of schooling uh, in the field of social work. Uh, my experience in reality has been that education is more about understanding. Uh, my professors and myself as, as well teach in the, in the pursuit of understanding. Um, and we teach uh, for the aim of teaching students how to think for themselves, not just to you know, uh, think the way that we're thinking. And if you can see the infographs here, try to get a little creative. Uh, but if you look at the, the, the one on the right, uh, we see that uh, a number is shown at the uh, bottom there. And there are two people on each side. One sees six, the other sees nine. And I think that's a powerful statement that just because you were right does not mean I am wrong. And I think uh, my experience of education has been that it's that right infograph as opposed to the left one. I thank you for your time. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions if you have any. Well, thank you, Professor Alam, for being here. We really appreciate you taking time away from your, your busy schedule today for sharing these ideas with us. So are you able to take some questions? Yes. Thank you very much. Maybe as long as they're softball questions. <laughs> softball questions. Only the softball ones. Yes. Mr. Spoon. Yes, so Madam Chair and Dr. Salam, or I'm sorry, Dr. Oh. Alam. Oh. Yes, Dr. Alam. Um, this is a three-part question, and so I'm trying to figure out where you're coming from here, which is why it's three parts. Mm -hmm. uh, you stated that you believe the diversity of thoughts and values in the American university system. Do you believe that that diversity of thoughts and values is representative of the diversity of thoughts and values in the American population as a whole? Or is, does one ideological group hold higher representation in the American university system, can well, I identify that? Mr. Long, sorry, it's fine, go ahead. Right. My experience has been that there is uh, an equal representation in the diversity of thought in classrooms. Again, that's been my experience, and I see you smiling, so I take that you don't believe that. But I can only speak about my experience as, as a student for many years, and now as a professor for about seven, eight years now. Um, I do create an environment where we're, we're discussing these different topics in, in all these different perspectives. Uh, it does take a little bit more time, obviously, because you know every concept and every idea, if we're gonna take different perspectives too, if we're essentially doubling, tripling, quadrupling the amount of time that we're spending on each topic, which would be one of the counterpoints to the point counterpoint teaching philosophy is that is it, is it, is it good management of time, which I would say you do have a point there. Okay, um, I don't, yeah, I don't have the studies at my fingertips, but uh, multiple studies would indicate that liberal and pro-CRT philosophies hold far greater sway in the American university system. Mm -hmm. So you seem to be promoting at least the teaching of CRT. Would you endorse then Ibram Kendi's solution for balancing these ideological groups? In fact, if the liberal ideological group has higher representation in the American university system. Do you agree with Ibram Kendi's solution that the only remedy to discrimination is discrimination? The only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. The only remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination. I left out the word racist because he was talking about critical race theory. We're talking about ideological representation. Should we start discriminating against people with liberal ideologies to rebalance representation in our university system. And if you don't agree with that, then why do you disagree with critical race theory? Professor Alon, is that a softball question for you? Doesn't sound like a softball, that's a, that's a 100 mile an hour fastball right there. <laughs> but uh, I'll try my best, I'm not Joey Gallo, but uh, uh, first of all, I wanna make it clear that I'm not promoting the teaching of anything, that's precisely what I'm not doing. I'm saying that uh, an academic environment should be one 
that is free of certain promotions. That it's a, it's a free thinking space, so I'm not, I'm not in favor of promoting anything, but more importantly, as per this conversation, I'm not in favor of banning anything. I'm not in favor of censoring anything. And that's where I'm coming from with critical race theory as well, if you want to speak specifically about that. Um, I think uh, when we're talking about controversial topics like this, if we cover several competing perspectives on that particular topic, I think it gives a better picture of what's going on there. Um, my personal opinion, as I keep saying over and over again, is that uh, when a topic is taught from the perspective of a singular, singular perspective, then it doesn't leave enough room for opposing perspectives. And um, my experience has been, again, again, it's just one person and one, right? So uh, my experience has been, both as a teacher and a, I mean, a, a student and a professor, uh, we've had uh, equal representation. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that was a clear answer. I don't know if I hit it out of the park. <laughs> Maybe a single or double, right? We agree on the principle of equal representation, possibly not on the result. Okay, fair enough. Okay, great. Committee, uh, Reverend Wilson. Madam Chair, okay. and Professor Long. Um, your, your presentation, to my mind, is very refreshing. Thank you. Your, your whole, your whole counter, point counterpoint philosophy, to, to me, is it's right out of a reconciliation playbook, and I, I appreciate it very, very much. My biggest problem with, with some of the materials we've covered, this, here, here comes my question, is that they are not always presented in terms of facts, in terms of truth. Uh, for example, and I'm going to just give you an example because this is something this is a hobby horse of mine. 1619 Project is often taught alongside critical race theory. One of, the, one of the principal contentions of 1619 is that the American Revolution was fought for the purpose of preserving slavery. Now, that's just not true, and, and I'm sure you know that I'm not going to argue with you about it. But my question is, or, or for example, that 1619 also you know, says that the capitalism was behind slavery when in fact it was the abolitionist movement was almost entirely fueled by mega capitalists. My question then is, is how, does, how does your point counterpoint deal with a situation where you've got, on the one hand, things that are simply, that are factually correct, and other things that are, that are not. How, how do you address that in a point counterpoint? Sure, <laughs> so, uh, as, oh, I keep forgetting, sorry about that. <laughs> so, um, my opinion is that the solution to what we might consider bad ideas or more ideas. Uh, so if we create an environment where we're having a conversation that's more detailed, as opposed to saying this is the way that it is and this is the only you know, way of perceiving history. Um, I think we sort of pigeonhole ourselves into a particular perspective and viewpoint. But if we create an environment, again, where we're having these discussions and we're talking about these topics in several different perspectives, again, time you know, permitting, uh, then I think that, that doesn't solve the problem. I don't think anything ever truly really solves problems. We, we sort of try to address it in such a way that uh, that, that is clear that we're not taking uh, a side in, uh, in, the, in the conversation. Further questions? Anna, did you have a question? Oh, yes. Thank you for being here today, and thank you for your presentation. Previously, a student from one of your classes sent me a video wherein you entertain the viewpoint, what you call the solid viewpoint, that white people should be slaves. You talked about point-counterpoint philosophy. Is there a corresponding argument, um, in your view, which you discussed maybe in class, for enslaving other races, or what was the counterpoint to I the solid viewpoint that you should enslave white people? Professor, did you? No, that, that I don't know if you had a different professor, but I, yeah. <laughs> we have the recording. Okay. So, remember to go to the committee chair members. Any further questions? Uh, professor Yenner. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Thank you, Madam Chair. We're both professors, so we're not used to yes. working for chairs. <laughs> we're used to being the, the top dog, so it's hard for us. Right? Um, uh, I want to maybe just ask a little bit more about the point counterpoint thing. I mean, I, I teach, you know, people always think I have an axe to grind. I generally think I don't uh, when I teach. Um, but Here we are. Uh, that's, that's always the way it is. Uh, do you think that it's the uh, job of departments? to uh, advance environmental justice. Advance the cause of environmental justice. Uh, I don't know that I'm equipped to answer that question. Uh, 
I don't know that uh, I think departments tend often to encourage an academic freedom, as you're quite aware. Um, I don't I don't have an answer for you there. Follow up. Yes, may I? Yes. Uh, uh, do, does the idea, in your view, of point counterpoint teaching include? advancing human rights, advancing environmental justice, advancing social and economic justice, uh, engaging in, uh, in policy practice? Uh, the, point counterpoint, sorry, the point counterpoint teaching philosophy uh, aims to approach these topics as in what would it mean to uh, take the stance that we should be progressing, as well as what does it mean to take the stance that we should not be progressing these viewpoints. Um, you know, uh, we would like to be able to entertain and uh, create a safe space in an academic environment where we are entertaining all of these ideas. Um, but uh, I personally don't believe that in the way that I teach uh, that, you know, I'm advancing anything. I'm just trying to have a conversation. Ultimately, I want my students uh, to learn, uh, to ask the questions necessary to sort of uh, learn how to think for themselves uh, as opposed to thinking, thinking the way that I think. Follow up. One quick comment, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I, mean, I was reading those things from the Department of Social Works, Department of Learning Objectives, mm -hmm. which include things like advanced human rights and social and economic and environmental justice as a core competency mm -hmm. that students have to have before they, uh, before they leave. So it seems to me, uh, and just please correct me if I'm wrong about this, that, uh, that your teaching style doesn't quite fit in with the core competencies of the department. That, uh, that is seeking to advance particular causes. Well, what is the advance? Sorry, I keep forgetting. I'm probably going to keep doing this. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, what does it mean to advance social and economic justice? Um, you know, the, one of the conversations is that we might want to advance racial justice and uh, gender gender equality and things like that. But are we also including the diversity of thought? where we have people coming from the left side of ideology and right side of ideology and being able to share that safe space together. So there's room for a conversation there. I, I would uh, challenge that I'm not going against those core competencies and principles. Uh, rather, I'm using my academic freedom to interpret them the way that I'm permitted to, to do. Any further questions? Laura. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, what subjects do you teach? Social work. What? Social work. Social work? Social work, yes. What in particular in social work? I teach intro to social work. Just and, intro? Yes, and human behavior as well. I've taught in previous, well, this is my first time, uh, first year uh, with Boise State University. I've taught uh, research one, research two, human behavior. Yeah. Okay, so if Laura, I'm the Madam Chair. <laughs> I'm not good. I'm teaching a happy, a good lesson. I'm just glad I'm not the only one. Nice job. Okay. Um, um, no, I lost my train of thought. Um, so if, if the point counterpoint, mm -hmm. I appreciate that idea. Mm -hmm. But if you have a student that says something completely ludicrous, I identify as an artichoke today. Is that going to be okay? Professor Alam. <laughs> yeah, later that time. There you go. Uh, we, we, if time permitting, we'd have a conversation about that and sort of talk through that. We wouldn't, uh, like, I wouldn't want to understand why. That's the point of education, is it to shut down that idea. But we want to understand why, you know, a student might like, identify as an, as an artist. I don't mean to laugh at that. I'm sorry. Well, I, mean, I mean it to be funny. Um, I mean it to be funny. I mean it to be funny. Okay. Because it's ludicrous. But that seems to me what is going on out there in academia is total ludicrousness. Maybe, maybe. Just, let's just stick to questions for the professor and not comment on, on our observations of other things going on. So we want to make sure that we're respectful to our presenter here today. I, I just want to ask the question. Yeah, I, I also, I'm not speaking on behalf of Boise State or any other faculty members. I want to keep reiterating that. Uh, Mark, did you have a question? I do, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Dr. Long, uh, great presentation. I think superior in delivery, and I 
I personally uh, appreciate the content and look, I hope I have the time to learn more about it. Um, and so uh, not understanding the depth of the principles you uh, explained, I want to kind of dial in on um, agreement mm -hmm. and uh, understanding. pre-existing understanding. And then in the context of, I, I'm, I, I wrote, I quoted you here, never been in a room where everyone agrees with one another. And so I, I had the pleasure of speaking to Doc uh, Moggin this morning for like 30 minutes on the side of the road when we had a signal. Mm -hmm. um, he's the director, as you know, of uh, the social work department at Boise State. And so what we chatted about is, yes, at the university level, it might be appropriate and beneficial to uh, entertain ideas of being an artichoke, for example, or whatever the case might be. But I, I think one of the things, um, so in the third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, I, I think most people agree that kids should be taught racism is wrong, that lying is wrong, um, honesty is right, um, being unbiased is right. And so to us, yes, so at a higher level, yes, pre-existing agreements, agreements, things like that, assuming everyone in the room thinks the same, bad idea, especially at a university, right? Mm -hmm. But but don't you think it's fair that at a younger age, um, say K through eight or maybe K six, whatever, that it's appropriate to teach them certain virtues, the difference between right behavior, wrong behavior. Uh, can you comment on that, please? Awesome. Uh, I respectfully cannot because I've never taught at that level, nor do I have children that myself to, to reference in that way. I'm just not qualified. I have my opinions, of course, but I don't, I'm not qualified to speak on that. Madam Chair? Follow up. Yes, um, so you do have an opinion on that. So will you please share, Dr. Long? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Madam Chair? Follow up? Please. So I did sit through, um, just so you know, I went to, I studied social work for the last two years at Walla Walla U. And I was in the, say, you know, I, I went to grad school, right? So I was in two years of studies. And I've been the only person in the room that had an opinion that was different than everyone else. And there was, there was a bias in that room. There, as a 50 year old man, retired Marine, I was, there was a lot of pressure. I felt intimidated, mm -hmm. and I, I felt oftentimes like I wasn't given a chance. Now, that wasn't your class, but there was a lot of pressure in the room, and I felt intimidated to share uh, my opinions. And, and oftentimes when I did, I would get trumped by the professor, and you know everyone else in the room would dogpile on the, on the comment and feed off the professor's comment. So I, I do, from a personal experience, know that it's not, there's not a level playing field in every classroom. Mm -hmm. That's oh, all okay. happening. Is that a question for That was a statement. Okay, that's a statement for the committee member. And, and if you respond. may respond. Yeah, I was, sure. yeah, first thank you for your service. I, yeah, I appreciate, we, we all appreciate that. And as far as, uh, you know, uh, being in an environment where you felt like you weren't being heard, um, you know, I, that's what I've heard a lot of people say, and that's obviously why I'm here today. I uh, will say that this presentation, uh, probably a couple of edits, a couple of tweaks, I will be presenting at Boise State University with the Center for Teaching and Learning, where there will be uh, other professors there. Um, so teaching, or rather, I will be presenting, it's called the Teacher Spotlight, uh, where I'll be talking about this particular way of teaching, teaching philosophy. Will it reach folks? I don't know, but at least it's, uh, you know, it'll be there. Yeah, I'm sorry for your experience. I haven't seen many softballs. But <laughs> I suppose I, if I can I just go if there's a hard ball coming in. Yeah. Okay. I'm okay with continuing. So. Thank you. Thank you for the, that accommodation. We appreciate you very much. Sonia. So, my question is um, who should ensure that a teacher or a professor presents or allows several competing perspectives? On an issue, Professor Long. Well, that's a good question. I don't have an answer for you yet. Um, 
uh, I don't know whose responsibility it should be. Uh, again, I'm, this is just my teaching philosophy, this is the way that I teach, nor is this a, a recommendation of how others should teach. Uh, I understand that this teaching philosophy is, is also flawed, um, but I, I can't answer that question. Further questions? Ryan? Yes, Madam Chair, Dr. Alon. Um, Dr. Alon, this is a, a bit of more of a softball than my first one. <laughs> this one's just about something as boring as money. Oh. Um, since this task force scope is limited to public institutions, mm -hmm. do you feel that it is an efficient use of taxpayer dollars to spend classroom time teaching every possible entertainable point and counterpoint that anyone can come up with? Yeah, that's a good or should, we, or should we limit that? Yeah, that's not as much of a softball as you said that it was, <laughs> but uh, um, Clearly the answer would, would be likely not, right? Because if we were to, there are so many theories of human behavior, we could spend an entire academic career, four to 20 years learning all those theories. Um, so you know, common sense would suggest that we don't have the time to spend time on every single idea. But at the same time, there are ideas that are hot topics, controversial topics, like we're all here today to talk about CRT. Clearly it's important. You know, so when for topics like this, I think I think it makes sense to, to see different perspectives uh, versus whether or not food is important. Okay, are there any other questions from the committee for Professor Alon? Okay, well, Professor, once again, thank you so much for making time to come talk to us today, and it's been an interesting and good debate discussion. And thanks for being here. Now, when you're when you come back to testify before the legislative committee, you're going to know exactly how you're supposed to address the chair and the committee. So, <laughs> Don't tell me that was helpful for you. Thank you so much. For Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. That was the end of that. That was. All right. Thank you, committee. Next on the agenda. Lieutenant Governor McGeehan is going to talk about the State Board of Education, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yeah, we're going to come back to part two.